Praise the Lord. I said, Praise the Lord. I welcome everyone to a Bible study tonight in Jesus' name. It will be Bible study as of old. And if you were here many years ago and you attended a Bible study, you know that you got insight into the Word of God. And I pray that tonight every one of us will have insight into the Word in Jesus' name. And if you are tired, you are weak, you are weary, you are slumbering, you are lukewarm, the Bible study tonight will wake you up. It will arouse you and make you to stand up again in the strength of the Lord. And you will walk in the way of the Lord in Jesus' name. I want to counsel everyone that you pay attention so that the best the Lord has for you, you will have in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. Lord, we ask that your spirit, the Holy Ghost, will be present here as I teach. As your people listen, your spirit will lead us into the depths of truth we need for our lives in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that those of us who are getting tired and weary and lukewarm, you will stir us up in Jesus' name. And you show us things in your word belonging to us. And things that will edify every one of us in Jesus' name. Turn every life around. Turn the families around and wake up your church to follow in the footsteps of the Lord in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And somebody shout. We're coming to Mark chapter 3 tonight. And we're reading from verse 7 all through to verse 21. The passage of a study today, Mark chapter 3, from verse 7. But Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him, and from Judea. Go to verse 13. And he goes up into a mountain and called unto him whom he would and they came unto him come to verse 7 verse 16 and simon his son named peter and james the son of zebedee and john the brother of james and his son named them bonages which is the sons of thunder and andrew and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon of the, Can the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him, and he went into, a into an house, and the multitude cometh together again, so that they could not so much as each bridge. And when a spring's hurt of it, they went out to lay hold on him, for they said is beside himself. Tonight we're looking at the choice or the calling of the toil. Tonight's message is titled The Purposeful Calling of the Twelve by Christ. The twelve, the twelve apostles, he called them. And he called them for a purpose. He called them because there was something for them to do. He called them so that they will be with him. Before we talk about the twelve, let's look at our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Our Lord Jesus Christ was passionately occupied in his father's business. You remember from the age of twelve, when he went to the temple, 
and then the mother and the Joseph were looking for him when eventually they found him in the temple and the mother said well you've not done like this that we have been searching for you you remember what he said we're looking at Luke chapter 2 in Luke chapter 2 reading from verse 48 you'll see what Jesus said to Mary the mother Luke chapter 2 I'm reading from verse 48 it says in verse 48 and when he, they saw him they were amazed they were surprised and his mother said unto him son why as thou thus dealt with us behold thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing and he said unto them how is it that he sought me Wist ye not, knew ye not, that I must be about my father's business? He came to this world to do something, something definite, something purposeful, something positive, something practical, something that is for the redemption of the whole of humanity. But Mary and Joseph did not understand, and he said to them, were you searching for me? Were you seeking for me? I came to this world for something definite. And they understood not, in verse 50, the saying which is speak unto them. But the Lord Jesus Christ was occupied in something that had been ordained from all eternity. It wasn't an afterthought. It wasn't something that God just said, okay, what are we going to do now? It was planned before the foundation of the world. Titus chapter 1. In Titus chapter 1, I'm reading from verses 2 and 3. Titus chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised. Tell me what you see there. Before the world began. In hope of eternal life he came to give us life he came to give us eternal life he came to redeem us from a spiritual death and bring us into life eternal and it said it was promised it was planned from the foundation of the world before the world began but as in due times manifested his word through the through preaching which is committed unto me according to the commandment of god our savior let's come to chapter 10 i'm reading from verses 17 and 18 john chapter 10 reading from verse 17 jesus christ committed himself to the definite work of redemption he had irreversible, he had irreversibly committed himself before the foundation of the world, before the world began. The Father and the Son had spoken. And the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, had committed himself before the world ever began. And before his incarnation, before the mother Mary even knew him. And before the Pharisees confronted him, he had committed himself to this work. And he purposed in his heart, he was going to continue against all odds. Let's look at John chapter 10, as I read from verses 17 and 18. John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. Therefore does my father love me. Because I laid down my life, I, I, and that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. I'm telling you from Scripture that that decision of Christ that commitment of Christ, that surrender of Christ, and that work and ministry of Christ was given to him before the world began. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 
First Peter chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 18. First Peter chapter 1 verse 18. For as much as she know that she were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers but look at this but with the precious blood of christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world foreordained before the foundation of the world the work had been determined the ministry had been determined that it will come to this world and make that great sacrifice and that full sacrifice that redemptive sacrifice that will take humanity from sin and bring them to the salvation of the lord it had been ordained and decided before the foundation of the world who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest to uh, in these last times for you why am i reading all this am i reminding you of all this before the pharisees were born before the nation of israel came into existence the lord jesus christ had knew about his ministry had knew about had known about his work and he had known that this is what he will do so the presence of the pharisees and the presence of the sadducees that were born yesterday that came yesterday they knew nothing about religion when christ was already committed to the work he was going to do that's the reason why it didn't matter at all that the pharisees were there that the sadducees were there the lord jesus christ committed himself to the work he had agreed to do before the foundation of the world if you look at your life too if you look at your calling too if you look at your ministry too and you know that you're not just uh, somebody that came as an afterthought that god knew you before you were born he ordained it before you were born he had the full knowledge of what you will do and he has now appointed you and he has said this is what you do Pharisees will not matter to you Sadducees will not matter to you because you will know the lord like he appointed Jesus, like your day Jesus, and that he put Jesus there as a redeemer before the foundation of the world, he had put you there, he has ordained what will happen through your life before the opposition, before the persecution, before the Pharisees, before the Sadducees, you will do the work he has committed in your hands in Jesus' name. In the passage I read to you, Christ continued his appointed ministry and he chose 12 apostles who will carry on the ministry after his ascension. They needed to come in so that after Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, after he had sacrificed for the sins of the whole world and was buried and he will rise again and then they will ascend to heaven there will be people that will carry on that work after his ascension. That's why we're looking at the passage today, the purposeful calling of the twelve by Christ. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, the powerful cure of common and uncommon diseases by Christ. The powerful cure, the powerful healing the great deliverance and the great recovery of the people that were sick with common diseases and on common diseases he healed them all and jesus christ is still the same yesterday today and forever what he did before is able to do today he will do in your life in jesus name the powerful cure of common and uncommon diseases by christ point number two the purposeful call of converted disciples by christ after he healed the people then he went to the mountain to pray to a solitary place to pray and after that prayer he made the choice of 12 disciples 
that became 12 apostles. The purposeful call of converted disciples by Christ. Point number three, the practical cultivation. Cultivation development, cultivation transformation, cultivation training, cultivation making them to be who they ought to be. The practical cultivation of consecrated disciples by Christ. These were disciples that knew nothing. And he had to take the watch of the kingdom, the knowledge and the truth of the kingdom to the whole of Israel and eventually to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. They needed to be trained, they needed to be qualified and cultivated the practical um, cultivation of consecrated disciples by Christ. Let's come back to point number one. The powerful cure of common and uncommon diseases by Christ. We're coming to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 7. Mark chapter 3, we're reading from verse 7. And but Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him and from Judea, and from Jerusalem, and from Idumea, and from beyond Jordan, and they about Tyre and Sidon, and a great multitude, when they had heard what great things he did, came unto him. And he spake to his disciples that a small sheep would should wait on him because of the multitude lest they should throng him and then in verse 10 for he had healed many in so much that they pressed upon him for to touch him as many as had plagues and unclean spirits when he saw him fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. Praise the Lord. And he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. This is a powerful kill. This is a powerful healing that Jesus Christ performed. We're studying the Bible. In this section, we see number one, great multitude. Great multitude. Number two, we see great miracles. Number three, great maladies. Great maladies. Great diseases. Number one, a great multitude. Anyway, Jesus went because of the manifestation of power and because of the demonstration of the grace of God and the gifts of healing. Multitudes followed. And that's the same thing we'll find if you look at verse 7, it says a great multitude. If you look at verse 8, it also mentions, after time Sidon, a great multitude. If you look at verse 9, the latter part, the multitude wanting to touch him. And so you see, number one, a great multitude. They knew that something was happening in the nation that had never happened in the history of the nation and therefore they came from everywhere they were searching for Jesus and looking for Jesus and they came to Jesus and they amounted to a great multitude the same thing today if you find anywhere where Jesus is alive where Jesus is manifested where Jesus is mighty a great multitude was still followed look at Mark chapter 1 4 verses 1 and 2. Mark chapter 4 verses 1 and 2. And he began again to teach by the seaside. And there was gathered unto him, tell me out there, a great multitude. A great multitude. It was always like that. It was constant. It was perpetual. There was never a time that Jesus would be there and he'll say, There's nobody to minister today to. There's nobody to reach out to because the great multitude always followed. Mark chapter 6, I read from verse 31. Mark chapter 6, 
I'm reading from verse 31. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by sheep privately, and the people saw them departing. And many knew that many knew him and ran a foot thither out of all the cities. You see that? Out of all the cities, and they outwent them and came together unto him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people. That's a great multitude there, much people. And he was moved with compassion toward them because they were a sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. A great multitude. Number two, great miracles. Come back to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. And I'm reading here from verse 8. Mark chapter 3, verse 8, and from Jerusalem, and from Idumea, and from beyond Jordan, and they, about town Sidon, a great multitude, when they had heard what great things he did. They had heard great testimonies, what great things he did. Those great things are available today. Jesus is still the same yesterday today and forever and as they heard what great things he did you will hear you will see you will feel you will have what great things he will do in jesus name and he spake to his disciples that his small sheep should await on him because of the multitude lest they should throng him for he had healed many for he had healed many, and he will heal many, and he will deliver many, and he will transform many. For he had healed many in so much that he pressed upon him to touch him as many as had plagues, great, great multitudes. We're looking at Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 13. Matthew chapter 14, verse 13, great miracles that he did and great miracles that he's still doing because his power cannot change, his power has not changed. Matthew chapter 14, verse 13, it tells us in verse 13, when Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by sheep into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. It doesn't matter the location where he was. You know, some people say it's because our church in the location is in the corner, it's at the outskirts, it's far away. That's why the people are not coming. If the power of God is there, they will come. I said there's manifesting of power of Christ, they will come. And from today, all those excuses will be taken away from my midst in Jesus' name. Christ will move mightily in your local church. And Christ will move mightily anywhere you are. And when the people know the power is manifested there, that authority, spiritual authority is manifested there, wherever they are and wherever you are, they will come, they will be touched, and great miracles will happen in their lives in Jesus' name. Look at verse 14. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude, always, and saw a great multitude, and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. And he healed their sick. Look at Luke chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 17. Luke chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 17. It says in verse 17, And he came down with them, and stood in the plain, 
and the company of his disciples and a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon which came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases great miracles great multitudes on the one hand great miracles on the other hand in verse 18 and they that were vexed with unclean spirits and they and they were healed and the whole multitude sought to touch him for there went virtue out of him and he healed them how many of them and he healed them i said how many of them oh and it's still the same today if you're sick thank god you are healed tonight you are delivered tonight there was no exception in his days here on earth he healed them all a great multitude a great miracle we're looking at chapter 6 of john john chapter 6 and i'm reading from verse 2 john chapter 6 verse 2 in john chapter 6 verse 2 and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles which he did on them that were diseased they had common diseases he healed them on common diseases he healed them the blind he opened their eyes the lame he made them to walk the meme he gave them the missing part of their body and those who are deaf and dumb he healed them those who are impotent and had been impotent and sick for many years even for decades he touched them and healed them with a single word he healed them and that power of christ has not changed it's still the same today and as we believe in that name the power in that name the authority in that name the anointing of the holy ghost that comes with that name will take away every infirmity from your life in jesus name number one a great multitude number two great miracles number three great maladies great diseases we're coming back to mark chapter three in mark chapter three i'm reading from verse 10 the diseases the people had were great great maladies it tells us in chapter 3 of mark and i'm reading from verse 10 all through to verse 12 for he had healed many is so much that they pressed upon him for to touch him as many as had plagues and unclean spirits these were the people he healed these were the people he delivered the people that had insanity the people that had madness the people that had legions of evil spirits dwelling in them driving them tormenting them tearing them apart he healed everyone if there's anything tormenting today you are healed in jesus name anything driving you to suicide and driving you uh, to untimely death you are delivered in jesus name and unclean spirits when they saw him fell down before him and cried saying thou art the son of god they recognized his authority they recognized his position and they recognized the very son of god no wonder then when he told them to keep quiet they were quiet when he told them to come out they came out when he told them to stop to harassing anybody they recognize is the son of god and because of that they listened and they obeyed and evil spirits obeyed him any evil spirit driving anyone here or anyone hearing the sound of my voice jesus will set you free and then it says in verse 12 and he straightway charged them that they should not make him known he charged them that they should not make him known great maladies look at luke chapter 7 luke chapter 7 i'm reading from verse 21 luke chapter 7 and we're reading from verse 21 in verse 21 it says and in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities 
and plagues and of evil spirits and unto many that were obliged he gave sight many 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 you see he didn't just heal a few and then said the rest is not the will of god the rest you are meant to suffer that the rest it was your sin that brought that to you if it was sin he forgive their sin and the sickness that came as a result of that sin he healed the sickness whatever the malady whatever the disease the great maladies he healed every one of them look at verse 22 then jesus answered and said unto them go your way and tell john that's john the baptist what things he have seen and heard how that the blind see the blind will see today the lame walk the lame will rise up and walk lepers are cleansed all that skin disease will go away in jesus name the deaf hear the dead are raised if you are dead he'll, he'll raise you up in jesus name and to the poor the gospel is preached and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me we're coming to john chapter 5 john chapter 5 i'm reading from verse 5 john chapter 5 and we're reading from verse 5 john chapter 5 verse 5 and a certain man was there which had an infirmity 30 and 8 years great maladies great diseases had the infirmity 30 and 8 years when jesus saw him lie down there and knew that he had been he had been now a long time in that case he says unto him will thou be made whole the impotent man answered him sir i have no man and my malady is great i've been here for 38 years i've been trying my best and i couldn't get healing but today you'll get healing i said today you'll get healing sir i have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool there's somebody greater than the pool there's somebody greater than medicine there's somebody greater than all the solution you have been trying to find his name is somebody tell me jesus he will kill every disease he will destroy every work of the devil he said i have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool while i am coming another step it down before me and jesus says unto him i want to know, you to notice what happened here jesus did not pray he is the authority he is the creator he is the divine healer he is the one that can recreate the whole world if he needs to i want you to understand jesus did not even touch him and the man had been there for 38 years the method of jesus he doesn't need to touch you he doesn't need to push you down he doesn't need to shake you a word of authority and a word of power will heal you even tonight in jesus name then jesus says unto him rise take up thy bed and walk and tell me the next word there immediately and tell me tell me aloud immediately you don't need to continue to suffer his healing will come to you his deliverance will come to you and immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked and on the same day was the sabbath now you need to understand it doesn't matter saturday he heals sunday he heals monday he heals his power is always the same and that man was healed look at chapter 9 of john john chapter 9 i'm reading from verse 30. john chapter 9 i read from verse 30. the man answered and said unto him why herein is a marvelous sin that ye know not from whence he is and yet he has opened mine eyes now we know that god heareth not sinners god heareth not sinners what that means is that god will not give the power 
of working miracles into a sinner's hand. Because it says, don't give that precious sin your peel unto swine, unto dogs. You will give them salvation if they pray for salvation. But the man is seen as for miracles, as for opening the eyes of the blind, as for doing spectacular things. We know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Verse 32, since the world began, was it not heard that any man Open the eyes of one that was born blind. He said, I was born blind and we have never read it in history. And you are religious leaders, you should know this. This had never happened since the world began. But he opened my eyes. What's the implication? It's greater than Pharisees, greater than Sadducees, greater than all men. It's high, higher above the whole of humanity. Because he could do everything, he could resolve every problem that man had. The powerful cure of common and uncommon diseases by Christ. We we'll come to point number two now. The purposeful call of converted disciples by Christ. We're coming back to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 13. Mark chapter 3, reading from verse 13. And he goes up into a mountain and calleth unto him whom he would. And he came unto him. He went up into a mountain. What did he go to do there? I read another passage to you that will show you what he went to do there. And then he called unto him these people, verse 16, and Simon, his son named Peter, he called him, and James, the son of Zebedee, and, and John, his brother, the brother of James, he called them, and his son named them Bonerges, which is the sons of thunder, and Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him, and they went into an house. There are three things we're looking at in this section. Number one, the prayer before their choice. He didn't just choose them. He went up to the mountain and he prayed the prayer before their choice. When you are going to take a great decision, you need to pray. When you are going to make great selection, you need to pray. When there is a great assignment and you want people that will fill in and do that great assignment, you need to pray. When you're thinking about your life and you want to choose somebody that will lift you up and help you, be a help me unto you, be a wife, be a husband unto you, and make the purpose of God in your life to be fulfilled, you need to pray. When you are looking for somebody that will partner with you and make you successful in what the Lord has ordained for you that you will do, you cannot just make a choice because of their facial appearance. You cannot just make a choice because they are familiar people. You need to pray. Number one is prayer before their choice. Number two, the proof of their conversion the proof of their conversion. He was going to send them out to tell people to repent. And he had to choose people that had repented. He was going to send them out that they will tell people they should be converted. Except a man be converted and becomes like a little child. He cannot see the kingdom of God. And those who are going to proclaim that must be converted themselves. The proof of their conversion. Number three his persuasion of their consecration his persuasion he was persuaded he prayed he made sure they were born again and then he was persuaded they were consecrated people 
because uh, the work he had for them to do was the greatest work any Israelite could do. The work he had for them to do is the highest and the greatest that anybody could be involved in throughout uh, our generation, generation after generation. And such a uh, people must be consecrated. And he was persuaded that they were consecrated. His persuasion of their consecration. Come to number one, his prayer before their choice. I'm looking at Luke chapter 6. In Luke chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 12. Luke chapter 6, we're looking at verse 12. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray. He went out to a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, when it was morning, after that night of prayer, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom he named apostles. You see, he prayed before the choice. Do you pray before you make an important choice? A place to live, a work to do, a brother to get married to, a sister to get married to, a church to attend, a profession to do, and the place where you will live and site your house is it that well the place available, so I'm just there. What did you pray? Jesus prayed before he made the choice. In verse 14, Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zealots, and Judas the brother of James and Judas Iscariot, uh, Judas Iscariot, which also was the traitor. The point is, he prayed. You know the apostles themselves, when they were choosing somebody to replace Judas Iscariot, what did they do? They prayed. They prayed. It's a principle Christ has led for us is prayer before their choice. Make sure you pray. You are taking a decision. Make sure you pray. There's no small decision. There's no irrelevant decision. Then you can't say, I don't have to bother God on this. Bother him. Bother him. He wants you to bother him because he knows the end from the beginning. He knows what you are going to face in the future. And he knows what each person that comes into your life will do. Whether they will destroy you or they will develop you, he knows. You must pray. Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 6, 15. Acts chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 15. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The number of the names together were about an hundred and twenty. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, uh, they said, Men and uh, brethren, and that's uh, verse uh, 16. Let's come to verse 21. In verse 21, wherefore of these men which accompanied uh, with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning at the baptism of John, until the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained, must one be appointed, must one be chosen to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And he appointed to Joseph, called Basabas, who was surnamed Justus and Matthias. And they prayed. You see that? Before they made a choice and they prayed, they had nothing against any of those two. They knew those two. Those two people have been going in and out with them for a long time. All through the time, Jesus was present with them. Even though they knew them and they didn't know anything negative about them, they still had to pray. 
why are you not choosing uh, this person? We have to pray. Why did God choose uh, Joshua instead of Caleb? We have to pray. Once we pray, then we know that this is the will of God. After that prayer, in verse 24, And they prayed and said, Thou Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two, which of these two thou hast chosen. It's not my choice, it's not your choice. Show us which of these two thou hast chosen. I pray you'll uh, pray before you make uh, choices in your life in Jesus' name. And God will answer your prayer. He'll choose the best for you. Acts of the Apostle chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, I read from verse 2. And as they ministered to the, to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Again, there was a work to be done. And the Holy Ghost knows about that work. And he knows the people that will fit into that work. And as they ministered to the Lord, and as they fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate unto me. He mentioned them by name. Paul, Barnabas, and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Look at verse 3. And when they had fasted and prayed, when they had fasted and prayed, when they had fasted and prayed, and they laid their hands on them and sent them away. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost departed unto Seleucia and from thence they sailed unto Cyprus. Number one is prayer before their choice. Number two the proof of their conversion. These people that the Lord Jesus chose after prayer were they born again? Were they children of God? Of course they were. He had told them in Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. I'm reading here from verse 3. Matthew chapter 18, verse 3. And he said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. How can you send somebody out to bring people into the kingdom who themselves or who himself will not enter the kingdom? If they were going to call on people so that they repent, they must have repented. If they were calling on people to be converted, they themselves must be converted. It tells us in Luke chapter 5, Reading from verse 32, Luke chapter 5, and I'm reading from verse 32. It tells us the purpose why he has come. It says in Luke chapter 12, verse 32, I came not to call the righteous, the self-righteous, the hypocritically righteous, the religious righteous people who are not born again. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Sinners to repentance. That's what he came to do. And that's what he made sure the people already had before he chose them. We're coming to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, I read from verse 12. And they went out and preached that men shall repent. Disciples, the twelve that he chose, he commissioned them, he sent them out, and he sent them out, and they went out, and they preached that men should repent. They themselves had repented. That's what gave them the authority to tell others to repent. Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, Reading from verse 20. Luke chapter 10, verse 20. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because somebody there tell me. Are you there? Because your names are written in heaven. Let's talk about the 70. If the 70 were born again and their names are written in heaven, 
why will you not choose any of them if these other ones do not have their names in heaven? They had their names in heaven. They were born again and they were converted. That's why he chose them. Number one, his prayer before their choice. Number two, the proof of their conversion. Number three, his persuasion of their consecration. He was persuaded beyond any shadow of doubt that these that he called were consecrated. And you want him to choose you for a special work, a special assignment, and to do exactly what he came to do, seeking to save those who are lost. You must be converted. You must be consecrated unto the Lord. Look at Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 27. Luke chapter 5, verse 27. And after these things, he went forth, and he saw a publican named Levi, the same person as Matthew, sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, Follow me. And he left how much of what he had did he leave? I said, how much did he leave? Virtually everything. He left all and he rose up and followed him. That's consecration. You remember the rich young ruler that came to Jesus and he said, Master, good master, what will I do to inherit the kingdom of God? And Jesus said, are you calling me good? God is the only one that is good because the man was thinking of Jesus just as a human being, just as a man like himself. He said, in, in any case, what does the scripture say? That shall not steal, that shall not kill, that shall not be a false witness, that shall not commit adultery, that shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor, honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment. He said, all these have I done. And since I was born, and Jesus looked at him and loved him, and he said, If you will have eternal life, go sell what you have, and give to the poor, forsake everything now, give to the poor, and come and follow me. And he went back sorrowful, sad, because he could not consecrate and commit himself to the Lord like that. But you see, these disciples that Jesus chose, they forsook all. And Jesus was persuaded that they are forsaking all. That's why he called them specially, that they will follow him. Look at verse 28. In verse 28, and he left all and rose up and followed him. That same grace God will give to you. Whatever you will hinder you from getting to heaven, you will forsake and you'll follow Christ. Whatever will make you look like the world, you will forsake and you'll follow Christ. Whatever will make you stumble and then you'll not be able to run the race to the very end, you will forsake in Jesus' name. A man that will be a sin partner that will be forcing you to commit sin, you will forsake. A woman that will hinder you and you will not make it on the final day, you will forsake her. Any work, any job, any company, any engagement that will hinder you from getting to heaven, you will forsake in Jesus' name. Any secret sin or cultic sin, a pass of darkness that will hinder you from getting to heaven, from being a real disciple of Christ, you will forsake in Jesus' name. Whatever it is, private your life or public in community that will hinder you from making it, even if that thing will bring a lot of money, if that thing will bring promotion, that thing will bring a lot to your life, then you say, if this thing is going to hinder me, others may, I will not, I must not, I cannot, I forsake them, you'll forsake them and be consecrated in Jesus' name. You know, there are some people saying, oh, others are in politics, others are in this and this. Why cannot not, not I do it? It's in your hand. If you want to go into, you know, politics and all that, but make sure it doesn't hinder you from getting to heaven. Anything that will hinder you, you might have position of power or you might have money or whatever. If that sin, whatever the name, politics or business, if it will hinder you from getting to heaven, you'll forsake everything in Jesus' name.
that's the consecration of those disciples. They forsook everything that will hinder them. That's why he chose them. Luke chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 28. Luke chapter 18, reading from verse 28. Then Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. Peter said, not only myself, all of us who have left all and will follow thee. And he said unto them, verily I say unto you, there is no man that has left house or parents or brethren or wife or children or the, for the kingdom of God, God's sake, who shall not uh, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come life everlasting you will have you will receive John chapter 8 is persuasion of their consecration John chapter 8 I'm reading from verse 11 John chapter 8 reading from verse 11 she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. That takes consecration. Go and sin no more. That sin partner is my only means of livelihood. That sin partner is my only means of shelter, accommodation. That same partner is my only source of earthly happiness. And yet, if I stay with him, if I stay with her, I'll be living in sin. And now that the Lord has forgiven the past, he says, you must be committed unto the Lord. Go and sin no more. The power to go and sin no more, the Lord will give unto you. Whatever you are deriving from that partner, Whatever you are getting from that association, whatever you are getting from that registration, initiation, what, even if it's your livelihood, but it's wrong. As the Lord has said, go and sin no more, you will not continue there. The power you have, the grace you have, the willingness you must have. Look at verse 12. Then speak Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Amen in your life. Amen in your Christian experience. Your Christian life will shine. And like the Lord chose these people to do special work and special tasks, his hand will be upon you. His eyes will be upon you. Your life will amount to something significant in Jesus' name. The Lord will choose you. Something good. Something great. Something high. Something of eternal value. The Lord will choose you too. Number three now, the practical cultivation of consecrated disciples by Christ. The practical cultivation of consecrated disciples by Christ. Let's come back to Mark chapter 3. We're reading from verse 14 and verse 15. Mark chapter 3, verse 14. And he ordained twelve, and he appointed twelve, and he put in place set apart twelve, that they should be with him. Notice that, that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach. Notice that, and to have power to heal sicknesses, and to cast out devils. That's why he chose them. But you see, before he could let them do those things, they will stay with him. They will abide with him. They will come to the school of Christ. He will train them. He will school them. He will enlighten them. He will educate them. 
he will change them and transform them from what they were to what they ought to be. Cultivation, like a farmer cultivates the farm. So he will cultivate in them the appropriate character, the appropriate conduct, and the appropriate charisma so that after that cultivation it will be people that will be fulfilled that will fulfill what he has said follow me and i will make you fishers of men he was going to make them fishers of men cultivate them the practical cultivation of consecrated disciples by christ there's a process of training there's a process of transformation there's a process of cultivation, and we'll see that clearly. And in all this, I'm going to show you now that the process that Jesus took in training them, enlightening them, helping them to grow, cultivating them, transforming them to who they ought to be. In our personal lives too, as the Lord has called us, it's not enough to just say, I'm born again, I'm born again. If we're going to do something you know, that others cannot do, that others will not do, if we're going to do that which God has appointed for us individually, we must go through this process of training and transformation and cultivation by Christ. Number one, conversion. Number one, conversion in the process he made sure there was conversion. Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 19. If you're going to be used of God, here is where it starts. Conversion. We're looking at Acts chapter 3 verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted. Otherwise you'll not get to the kingdom of God. Otherwise you'll not be a servant of God. Otherwise you'll not be a minister of God. Otherwise you'll not do anything significant in life. Significant according to the measure, according to the evaluation of the Lord. The process of cultivation starts with conversion. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from heaven from the presence of the Lord. Verse 26, unto you first God, having raised up Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. If you are going to be an instrument, a tool in the hands of God to turn other people away from iniquity, you yourself must have been turned away from your iniquity. Number one, conversion. Number two, association. Association. If you stay near the fire, you'll catch some heat. If you stay near a cold room, you'll uh, catch uh, some cold. If you stay in the sun, you're going to sweat. You must, if you stay near Christ, all the virtues of Christ and the ability of Christ and the goodness of Christ and the grace of Christ will flow into your life. Uh, come back and look at um, look at Mark chapter three. Mark chapter three. Association. Mark chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 14. In Mark chapter 3, reading from verse 14, and your day 12, that they should be with him. Your day 12, that they will be associated with him. Now Jesus is no more here in the physical. But we have all his word. And he said, heaven and I shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. He said, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And we have the privilege of associating with him. Reading his word, hearing his voice, having his spirit, looking at his life. I'm following after him and will not were separated from Satan and were separated unto the Lord. Association, association. Luke chapter 22. And I'm reading from verse 28. Luke chapter 22. We're reading from verse 28. In verse 28, this is what it says. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations, in my trials, association. That's how you train them. They saw everything he did. 
and he understood everything he did and then he passed that unto them eventually and he says and I appoint unto you a kingdom as my father has appointed unto me that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel Association Acts chapter 4 reading from verse 13 Acts chapter 4 verse 13 now when they saw the boldness of of uh, Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men uh, they marveled and they took knowledge of them uh, that they had been uh, with Jesus when well, you spend time with Jesus that character will come to you that courage will come on you. You'll not be shivering and you'll not be fearful of every little thing that happens in the process of our training, in the process of our cultivation. Number one, there is conversion. Number two, there is association. Number three, there is instruction. Instruction. He instructed them. That's how he trained them. He gave them the knowledge of what they did not have before. There is instruction. Matthew chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 51. Matthew chapter 13. And we're reading from verse 51. Number one, conversion. Number two, association. Number three, instruction. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 51, look at what it says. And Jesus said unto them, Have ye understood all these things? They say unto him, Yea, Lord, yes, Lord. Then said he unto them, Therefore, every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven, that's the instruction he gave them. They couldn't have known all those things and the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven without his instruction. Every scribe that is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is uh, that uh, that bringeth forth uh, out of his treasure things new and old. And then uh, number four, conviction conviction they needed to have the conviction that this is the christ because after he had left there are challenges that will come and there were there are a definite pressure that will come upon them and if they didn't have conviction they'll not be able to stay and so in training them he gave them he granted them conviction and look at john chapter 6 John chapter 6, and I'm reading here from verse 67. John chapter 6, reading from verse 67. Then said Jesus unto them, Will you also go away? Others have left. Will you also leave? Others have abandoned me. Are you going to abandon? Others have separated themselves. He wanted to know about their conviction. You see, people don't have conviction. When they go in, it's all right. They're there. When everybody is smiling, they're there. When God butters their bread and sugars their tea, they're there. But when things turn around a little, and things are not as easy, as rosy as it was before, you can tell the people that don't have any conviction, they're gone and so jesus in training them he had to train them to have conversion train them and make them have association and then instruction and then conviction and in verse 67 then said jesus unto the twelve will ye also go away then peter answered him at lord to whom shall we go he didn't say to whom shall i go he was talking for every one of them they all had this conviction to whom shall we go thou hast the words of eternal life and we believe and we're sure conviction and we believe and we're sure that thou art christ the son of the living god also the next thing in their training is exposition exposition 
exposition. You see, the, the Old Testament, it was a close book to the religious people of the day. They need to understand. And how to follow the Lord and walk in the ways of the Lord, they need to understand. But Jesus Christ had to give them exposition so that they are well trained. I'm looking at Mark chapter 4 and I'm reading from verse 34. Mark chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 34. In verse 34, and without a parable speaking not unto them. And when they were alone, he expounded all things unto his disciples. When they were alone. That's why they were abiding with him. That's why they were staying with him. That's why he said they will be with him. So that anything they didn't understand, he'll give them the necessary expression position he expounded all things unto his disciples we're looking at luke chapter 24 luke chapter 24 i read from verse 27 the process of cultivation the process of their development the process of their training and the process of their becoming the fishers of men luke chapter 24 verse 27 and beginning at moses and all the prophets he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself he expounded unto them that's part of the training exposition Look at uh, verse 45. In verse 45, Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Exposition. The next thing uh, that he used in developing them, in training them, in cultivating them, is demonstration. Demonstration. He will give them instruction theory and then he will demonstrate it to them and say this is what I mean and this is how to do it in healing he demonstrated in casting out devils he demonstrated in walking miracles he, demonst he demonstrated he had been talking to them about humility and they didn't really catch it and then he demonstrated unto them demonstration I'm looking at John chapter 13. John chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 15. John chapter 13, verse 15. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. I've demonstrated it. I've shown you very clearly how you ought to comport your life your interaction with one another it says in verse 16 very late, very late, I say unto you the servant is not greater than his lord neither he that is uh, he that is sent greater than he that sent him if ye know these things appear ye if ye do them i've shown you demonstration look at chapter 15 of john john chapter 15 I'm reading from verse 15. John chapter 15, verse 15. Henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Demonstration. And then there was impartation. Impartation. You see, in their training, it wasn't just like, yeah, okay, they were converted, okay, they were staying with him, and then he instructed them, and they had conviction, and they had exposition, and they had demonstration, and said, that's all. No, he gave them impartation, impartation. We're looking at Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, impartation. In Luke chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 1. Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power, that's impartation, and gave them authority, that's impartation, over all devils and to cure diseases, impartation. Look at chapter 10, Luke chapter 10, reading from verse 
1. After these six, the Lord appointed other seventy also, and he sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great. And the you pray ye, therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers unto his harvest. And then in verse 9, and heal the sick that are therein. And say unto them, the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. Impartation. After that impartation, delegation. He must show them what to do. He must give them what to do. What's the use of giving instruction and he's never telling them, go and instruct other people? What's the use of expounding the word of God to them and never told them, go and explain to other people? What's the use of impartation and never sending them to the field for their own part of the work? Delegation, delegation. We're coming back to Luke chapter 9, delegation, verse 2. And he says, uh, this, uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 2, and he sent them to preach, delegation. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He delegated the work unto them. We're looking at Matthew chapter 10, from verse 5. Matthew chapter 10, I'm reading here from verse 5. Delegation. It tells us in Matthew chapter 10, verse 5, these 12, these 12, their names are from verse 2 to verse 4, these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as she go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, delegation. Cleanse the lepers, that's delegation. Raise the dead, he delegated that to them. Cast out devils, freely ye have received and freely give. You see the process, the process of Christ developing them, training them, transforming them, and making them the fishers of men, they ought to be conversion, association, instruction, conviction, exposition, demonstration, impartation, delegation, supervision. After you sent them out, you didn't just, okay, you've done it, you can go. They came back to report to him because he must supervise. How did you do it? What did you say? And he gave them chance one by one to say what they had done. We're looking at Mark chapter 6, reading from verse 30. Mark chapter 6, verse 30. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. Why was that necessary? For supervision. He needed to know what they had done, what they were doing, what they had taught, what they were teaching. The same thing today, when you have an assignment, you must not just hold on to that assignment and then you are not responsible to anybody. You must come back to the one that sent you and for the one to the one that appointed you, humanly speaking, and give an account of what you are doing so that you can have proper supervision. In verse 31, and he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. They need to be refreshed, supervision. And I will have correction. After he supervised them, and he listened to all, all that was going on between them, he corrected them. Supervision will not be complete if there's no correction. And Jesus Christ, in the process of developing them, 
give them correction. Luke chapter 22. We're reading from verse 24. Luke chapter 22. Reading from verse 24. And there was also a strife among them, which of them shall be accounted the greatest. Here was something that shouldn't be expressed, shouldn't be done by them. They had gone out, they had healed the sick, and they had cleansed lepers, and they had done quite a lot of great works, miracles, but there was something still not quite there in their character, in their expectation. And he said unto them, here's the correction now, the kings of the gentle sex exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors, but ye shall not be so. Correction. And, but ye shall not be so. Correction. In the work God has committed into your hand, in the ministry God has committed into your hand, do you give allowance for your leader to correct you? Do you give allowance for the pastor to correct you? Do you give allowance for the GS to correct you? Or you have done it all, you can do it all. And even if there are things that are hindering your maximum productivity, you don't allow any correction. We need correction correction in the process of cultivation but ye shall not be so but he that is greatest among you let him be as the younger and he that is chief let him be, let him let him uh, that is chief as he that doth serve for whether is greater he that seateth at meat or he that serveth is see not he that sitteth at me, but I am among you as he that serves. I am among you as he that serves. The next scene is intercession. Intercession. He prayed for them. He prayed for them, every one of them, so they can have what they have not had. He prayed for them so that internally they will be who they ought to be. Externally, they will also be productive and they will be profitable for the kingdom of God. Intercession. Christ interceded for his disciples. And those of us who are leaders today, we give instruction, yes. We give supervision, yes. We give correction, yes. And we give exposition, yes. And now intercession. In John chapter 17, verse 9. John chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 9. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. I pray for them. That's intercession, intercession. And he's still making intercession right now for those of us he has chosen, that he has sent to the field. Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 34. Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? Maketh intercession for us. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. I read from verse 25, Wherefore is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He ever liveth to make intercession for them. Privately, the leaders shall be praying for those who are under his leadership, is training them. And is developing them, is cultivating them to be the minister, the man of God, the woman of God that you ought to be. There must be intercession for such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. And now 
reproduction reproduction you see what he wanted to do was to reproduce in them everything that was in him reproduction that's why he said in luke chapter 6 luke chapter 6 i'm reading from verse 40 luke chapter 6 we're reading from verse 40 the disciple is not above his master but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master reproduction everyone that is perfected everyone that is matured everyone that is well trained everyone that has gone through all the training the cultivation is given shall be as his master first john chapter 4 verse 17 first john chapter 4 verse 17 herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is reproduction as he is reproduction as he is so are we in this present world that's what jesus did for his disciples he called them he gathered them together that they will be with him and then he got them through the process of reproduction the process of cultivation the process of training and the process of development conversion association instruction conviction exposition demonstration impartation delegation supervision correction intercession reproduction what you are going to do is to surrender yourself wholeheartedly head heart mind life everything that you are into the hands of the lord and the lord will mold your life the lord will mend your life and the Lord will monitor you and supervise you and reproduce the great image of his own personality in your life in Jesus' name. But you see, you must surrender yourself unto him. You must give yourself unto him. Without that, that you are with him, you have your quiet time, you read your Bible, you pray unto the Lord, you are in close association with the Lord and all these processes that he makes available today for the people is developing all these processes you'll make use of and you will grow in Jesus name you will rise higher in Jesus name and the work of the Lord will prosper in all our hands in Jesus name let me hear a good amen Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. We've had so much today. We've learned so much today that Jesus Christ knew his calling. And Jesus Christ stayed with that calling. And Jesus Christ remained in that calling. Whatever wind was blowing, whatever challenges were there, he stayed there. Pharisees were there. Sadducees were there. He committed himself to this work. The Lord had given him before the foundation of the earth. Earth. open your mouth and talk to the Lord and say Lord I've learned I want to be like Jesus I've known I want to be like Jesus I've heard it I want to be like Jesus nothing will stop me nothing will drive me away open your mouth and tell the Lord oh Lord here I am oh Lord here I am I surrender myself I surrender my heart I surrender everything unto you and I will follow you till the very end let him hear you pray Call upon him and say, Lord, here am I. I'll serve you. I'll follow you. The wind will not stop me. The storm will not stop me. Tell him. The difficulties will not stop me. Tell him. Challenges will not stop me. Tell him. Pharisees will not stop me. Tell him. Sadducees will not stop me telling he wants to do in you what he did in those disciples his sign will be upon you his grace will multiply your life tell him
the Lord had known you before you were born. Before you came into the kingdom, he knew you. And when you were born again, he knew you. As you have come into the kingdom, he knows you. And he has appointed what you will be. He has appointed what you will do. And you're telling the Lord, Lord, here I am. Totally in your hand. I lay myself on the altar, altar of consecration, commitment, consecration, never to look back. What you have appointed, I will be, I will be. What have appointed, you have appointed, I will do, I will do. Saved, be sure. Sanctified, be sure. Cleansed, be sure. Washed thoroughly, be sure. Totally committed without reservation unto the Lord, be sure. That a definite work of grace is done. Definite. Undeniable. Well proving. Be sure. A change, a transformation. That could not be done by human effort. But done by the power of the grace of God. Be sure. He has powerful cure. Whatever ailment, common ailment, common disease, uncommon disease, rare disease, terrible disease, Jesus is here. And He will cure you. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has not changed. Hand over that sick body unto him. Hand over the sickness unto him. He's been there for 12 years. He'll handle it. 38 years. He'll handle it. You are born like that. You will handle it. Medical aid has not been able to help. He'll handle it. Remember all the great multitude and the great miracles. Without any exception, he touched all of them, healed all of them. And the Bible says, and it's true, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Whatever the great malady, Whatever the great disease, whatever the great challenge, from the top of the head to the tip of the toe, from insanity to infirmity, will touch you, it will heal you. And you see the great work that he has to do. And he chose people. I just want the crowd. Or will you allow the Lord to choose you? He chose them. He prayed before choosing them. And you must pray as you want him to choose you. 
to do something in life that will make your life meaningful. To do something in life that others will not replace you. Lord, choose me. As I chose those apostles in days gone by, Lord, choose me. For something significant and worthy of your grace in my life, Lord, choose me. For something greater than earthly engagement, Lord, choose me. Tell him he'll choose you. But let there be a proof of your conversion that you are really born again, that there's no shadow of doubt, that even the devil will know as the devils confess that Jesus is the Son of God, that even the devils will confess they know you, that you are a child of God. Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know. Definite proof, definite, definite evidence that you are converted, that your life has grace, that you are shining forth the grace of God. Definite. You'll know the time you were born again, the place you were born again. And what happened, the change that took place in your life when you were born again? There'll be no shadow of doubt. In your own heart, your neighbors will know a change came in your life. Your life, your character will be a proof that you are converted. And he had persuasion of their consecration. Persuasion of their consecration. Nothing too big, you cannot give up. Nothing too high, you cannot give up. Nothing so attached to you, you cannot give up. Whatever will hinder your progress in the kingdom, decisively, voluntarily, persuasively, completely, you give it up. The persuasion of their consecration. Let the Lord be persuaded. He has called you. You have answered. And you mean to go all the way with the Lord. And as you commit yourself to the Lord, yield to the process of cultivation. Yield to the process of development. Don't just come and go as a people that crawl in and crawl out. Have the focus, the end result, in mind, in vision, in view. He wants to reproduce himself in you. Go through the process, conversion, association, me and my Bible, my Bible and I. That's the connection you have with the Lord. Quiet time, reading the word, personal study, personal profitable searching of the scriptures, association, instruction. Let him instruct you in the word. Begin to practice that kind of waiting for instruction. That you will not get up, run, helter skelter without instruction. Lord, speak to me. Lord, direct me. Lord, instruct me. Instruction. Don't be going about like a blind man. 
falling into this pit and falling into that other pit, let him instruct you. Conviction. Be a man of conviction. Be a woman of conviction. Let him bring up, develop in you such conviction that no matter what happens, you will never forsake the Lord. Conviction. Exposition. Don't just gloss over the scriptures. Don't just read verses without expounding, explaining. Have a thorough understanding of the word. And make it applicable in your life. Exposition. Demonstration. See him as he does it. See him as he demonstrates. And wait until you have impartation. Let him impart the spirit, the power, the gift, the anointing upon your life. Don't be an empty believer. Impartation. Delegation. Use what you've got. It's giving you the word. Speak it out. Delegation. We're going to have evangelism day this week and next week. Wednesday. We're part of that. That's part of the delegation. I've got something. Now I'm going to share it with people who do not have what I have. Supervision. Come back and say this is how we've done it. Supervision. Come back. Don't be a lone ranger. Be under supervision. Correction. Accept correction. Take correction. Expect correction. Do good with that correction. Remember, intercession is praying for you. Until his very image, his nature, is reproduced in you. And when that happens, your life will never be the same again. In Jesus' name we pray. And the believing people of God said, Amen. Father, we thank you today. We bless your name for your word. We thank you because Jesus Christ is still the same as he was yesterday. So he is today and so he will ever be. And we know you are here, Lord, in our midst. Lord, you are here. Lord, we acknowledge you are here. Because you said what two or three are gathered in your name, there you will be in their midst. And as you did in days gone by, do in the midst of your people in Jesus' name. Every sickness, every disease, every infirmity, I pray that you heal in Jesus' name. And whatever activity of demons or evil spirits, we crush them. We cancel them. Come out in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you because you are looking for people. Your work is still there. The ministry is still there. You are looking for people. You will select. You will choose to do a great work. Even in this generation. I pray for every brother. I pray for every sister. No life will be useless. No life will be redundant. Lord, I pray for everyone without exception. Touch everyone in Jesus' name. Select them. Choose them. Appoint them. And give them a work to do for your kingdom in Jesus' name. And like you trained and cultivated and transformed those chosen disciples in those days, the same thing, do with your people in Jesus' name. Until the image of Christ 
and the maturity in Christ will be reproduced in every life in Jesus' name. Lord, lift your people to the next level. Lift everyone to a higher ground. And I pray that your spirit will be mighty in every life from tonight in Jesus' name. Everything we have had today in the study, translate to every life. Confirm it, Lord. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray.